Bill Weasley got up from the couch and walked over to where his dad was standing. The design of the key had caught his eye. Can I see that for a moment, Dad? he requested. Arthur handed over the key to his second oldest son. Bill turned the key over in his hand. The combination of intricate scroll work as well as the absurdly low account number scrawled in goblin numerals dated the key to somewhere around a thousand years ago. I need to use the fireplace, he told Arthur, and made his way to the extra large fireplace on the far wall. He grabbed a pinch of green flute powder and made a secure call to his boss at Gringotts. When the ancient goblin answered, like Bill knew he would, goblins didn't take days off after all, he rattled off the account number and the password. As a curse breaker, Bill had learned early on how to memorize extremely long passphrases after only hearing them once. The goblin on the other end of the flu network did a small incantation, and the current account balance, and other pertinent information for the account, was magically written on a piece of parchment. Bill's boss rubbed the bridge of his long, pointed nose for a few moments before holding up the parchment for Bill to read. All Bill could do was blink a few times as he read the amount and who the account belonged to. Thank... Uh, th thank you, sir. We'll be in touch with the bank tomorrow, he assured the goblin. The green flames in the fireplace died down, and Bill got up from the ground, his legs a bit shaky. He looked at the doctor in wonder. Tonks noticed how awestruck Bill looked. Okay, I know it's none of my business, but I have to ask. What's in that vault? she inquired. Bill glanced at Tonks and then looked back at the doctor. As of this morning... Fourteen million six hundred twenty-two thousand one hundred and eighty-four galleons, he muttered, distracted by what else was on the parchment. All eyes turned towards Bill. Molly covered her mouth in shock. That's not the most amazing thing, though, Bill added. He held up the key for everyone to see. The account is anonymous, but whoever knows the account number and the password can see who originally opened the account, he told his friends and family. This particular account was opened by none other than Merlin himself, he stated. The doctor rolled his eyes. If you don't mind, I prefer to be known as the doctor these days, he requested. Fred fell off the arm of the couch he had been sitting on. Tonk's hair started rotating through the color spectrum while she sat in frozen awe. Molly was shaken to her core. She did what any good British citizen would do if they had just been told they had been raising Merlin's daughter. She stood up and made her way into the kitchen to make an extra strong pot of tea. When Ginny and Hermione had finished cleaning up, they had come down the stairs to find everyone but Harry and the doctor in shock. Her mom was so rattled, she was spilling the tea as she tried to pour it into the cups. The doctor noticed the young women return and suggested a trip to the TARDIS as a way for them to escape the flood of the questions he was sure would be forthcoming. The doctor suggested the students try looking through his wardrobe before going out and buying costumes for the ball. Tonks decided to go with the younger wizards and witches in an attempt to give her mind time to process all of the impossible things she had heard over the past hour. Ginny led her friends down the twisting corridors of the TARDIS after making their escape. The internal layout of the sentient pocket universe made about as much sense as the halls of Hogwarts. The map the doctor had provided wasn't much help due to it being crudely drawn and obvious disregard for changes in levels. Hermione caught up with Ginny and took the map out of her friend's hands, turning it ninety degrees to the side as she did so. I think we passed the hallway we were looking for at that last intersection, she told Ginny, pointing back the way they had come. Why do you think that? Ginny asked, but not in a challenging way. Truth was, she was having a hard time making heads or tails out of the map. Hermione frowned while she tried to form an answer. To be honest, I'm not quite sure, she replied. I just have a really strong feeling that it's back that way, kind of like the feeling you get when Hogwarts tries to lead you somewhere, she tried to explain. Ginny looked back at Harry, Ron, Tonks, and Luna. Luna was looking at the curved gold walls, oblivious to everything else, while the others just shrugged. Don't look at us. You two are the smart ones. I think this whole place is mental, Ron said. Ginny thought that Hermione's gut was probably a better guide than the doctor's map, and gestured for Hermione to lead the way. If she really had to choose, Ginny figured a drunk homing pigeon with vertigo would have been easier to follow than the doctor's map. After several turns that were definitely not on the map, they found themselves facing a huge set of double doors like the ones the doctor had said led to his wardrobe. That's weird, Ron snorted. Why would someone need doors this big on his closet? he asked rhetorically. 
He opened the doors and sucked in his breath. The room beyond was just slightly longer than the great hall back at Hogwarts. The room was large enough to play half-court Quidditch in. A central walkway led to a large, golden spiral staircase located in the center of the room. Ron first looked up towards the ceiling, and then down over the railing of the walkway. He saw there were at least four floors above them, and an equal amount below them. Never mind, he muttered. Hermione grinned at the other girls, who returned it with grins of their own as they raced towards the far side to see what treasures they could find. Harry pointed towards the bench near the central staircase, and Ron nodded silently. They sat down and made themselves comfortable. A section that seemed to be devoted to fashions of the late 1800s caught Hermione's eye. A beautiful white dress that looked like it belonged on a southern debutante caught her eye immediately. Next to it was a three-piece suit that made her think of a riverboat gambler. The jacket and pants were dark gray, while the vest was done in bright red satin paisley. A tan Stetson hat sat on the rack next to the suit. Look at these! She squealed. Luna... Tonks and Ginny rushed over and started making appropriate ooh and ah noises. Ooh! Ah! After pawing through several different time periods of clothing, a small, dark alcove off to the side drew Ginny's attention. Curious, she walked over to see what was stored there. When she arrived, the lights flickered on and her breath caught in her throat. The clothes her father had worn when she was born were mounted on a mannequin next to the entryway. The blue pinstripe suit and red trainers looked just as she had remembered them. The rest of the room had nine other mannequins, each one dressed in a very different outfit. She started to smile as a plan popped into her head. Tardis, please give me a visual representation of each of my father's traveling companions, sorted by which version of him they traveled with, she commanded. Holographic images of all the people who could claim the title of companion fanned out behind their respective doctors. The fact that the room had grown in size to accommodate this feat barely registered to Ginny. Turning quickly, she looked out into the rest of the wardrobe and shouted, Everyone, come here! I've got a brilliant idea! 